everyone. I am Lisa Lepke from Pro Writing Aid, and thank you for joining us for yet another session in the Pro Writing Aid series for writers. So today we have an amazing panel with us today, and our goal for the session is to help you understand the entire journey from your first draft when you when you put your final period on that sentence through to when you're a published author. Um, so on the panel today looking at that's going to help us understand story editing is Christina Stanley from Fictionary. Um, she's going to talk about how to perform an effective story edit. I'm sure you've seen her before. She's done several sessions with us and is always full of great ideas. Uh, you're stuck with me for talking about copy editing and the technical side of things. You, if you've been with us before, you know that I can go on and on about this. It's, um, it's a bit of a passion for me. Uh, Joella Nordstrom is here from First Editing. She is going to talk about when you make that next step and hire a professional editor and how to make that experience as painless as possible. And then new to our team is Tara Kremen from Kobo Writing Life. Um, she's gonna help us understand that next step from having a good, clean, perfect, ready to publish manuscript to getting it actually out into the world. Um, so thanks, for, thanks ladies for being here. Very excited to be here on my first uh, Pro Writing Aid panel. Thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome. So shall we start with you? Do you want to tell us a little bit about you and what you're bringing to the table today? Sure. Um, so I work for Kobo, which if you're not familiar, is um, an ebook and audiobook retailer um, that is headquartered here in Canada, which is where I am now. I am in Toronto, uh, but my accent is a little bit strange. I'm originally from Ireland. Um, so that is my background from Ireland, and I um, studied American literature and film. So I've always been very interested in books, um, but after university really was interested in how books merge with technology. So moving to Toronto and um, discovering Kobo, was sort of a, a wonderful place to put both of those interests into one um, kind of one job. Uh, so what I do for Kobo is I work for Kobo Writing Life, which is the um, self-publishing platform for Kobo. So it really easily allows authors to publish their books and get them up on our site and our partner sites. And uh, we allow publishing both ebooks and audiobooks, which uh, is kind of unique. So um, in kind of prior to heading up the Kobo Writing Life team, I worked with um, in the back end on the content with EPUBs and stuff like that. So uh, I can help you with any sort of technical formatting things and also help you market your books. So a little bit of everything. Um, oh, and I, we, always, yeah. we always get so many questions about those technical elements of uploading and formatting and making all of that work. So that's mm -hmm. great. And there's a couple of people in the chat. Heather says she has a Kobo. Um, oh, nice. So we've already, you've already got people from your team here, which is great. I nice. And maybe we could just start off with some trivia in the chat. Does anybody know what Kobo means? Like what it's an anagram of potentially? No? Anyone? It's book. It's book rearranged. That's we're just all about books. <laughs> oh. Oh, I love it. Kobo is just book mixed up. <laughs> exactly. So couple guesses in here. Not quite right. Nobody got it. Cool. Um, okay, and then Everybody should probably be familiar already with Christina and Joellen, but do you guys want to just give a quick reminder of who you are and what you're bringing to the table today? Sure. Um, so I'm Christina. If you don't know who I am, I'm the CEO and creator of Fictionary. Um, my degree is in computer mathematics, but my passion turned out to be writing, not exactly what I thought when I was much younger. I've written five novels. I've written one nonfiction book. I've co-authored a nonfiction book with Lisa and Joellen for Your Editing Journey. And this year, we're going to update that or perhaps write a new one with the four of us adding Tara in. It'll be your whole publishing journey. So we're kind of excited about that. I'm going to drop uh, a, I have a link story. for that as well. Yeah. Just so we've got it. Yeah, I've just dropped it. Anybody can grab it. Perfect. And so I'm also a story editor. I edit one book a month for the very specific reason. Okay, I love doing it. But um, I want to make sure that I'm always learning from writers on what they need from a tool and also what they need from working with a professional editor. And my favorite professional editing company, of course, is First Editing. So over to you, Joellen. All right. Thank you. My name is Joellen. I am... Uh in charge of first editing. So 
So I'm the instigator behind all of that. And we have been around since 1994, helped over 50,000 authors and uh, do everything, not just fiction, but also nonfiction business. We do a lot of academic uh, research for journals and publications like that. So we're, we're pretty wide to expand there, but anything that you write in English, we're gonna basically edit for you. And that can be on different levels of, a uh, content story, a line or copy editing as your final human eyeballs as I'm often referred to in this group. Um, we are the, also the first uh, certified editors from uh, Fictionary, which is really cool because we use their professional tools as we do all everyone in here. That's why we're working together. We use pro writing aid behind the scenes to make sure that we're double checking and doing everything objectively there. And that's the reason um, we got involved with Fictionary is it keeps us very objective in the high level editing which can be very subjective, but uh, by having all those, we, we do it very well. And then we're also very excited with Kobo. We love their platform, and, and but there is also the advantage of talking about other research and things out there. So it's very exciting to mix all this up together and see where, where we're going that. Um, so I'm going to start us off with our interview and questions tonight to let us introduce. I say tonight because I'm actually in Tenerife, which is a small island uh, off the co west coast of Africa. And I am in GMT along with Lisa, but I'm actually American, but normally in Sweden, if that makes any sense. But since COVID, nothing makes sense. So, Christina, <laughs> I want to ask you why you believe every author must perform a story edit on their own story. And you might want to tell us a little bit about story edit if they're not familiar with that. Okay. And you know, that's my favorite question, of course. So thank you for asking that. And I, before I say what a story edit is, I want to say that I believe so deeply that a writer should and can self-edit their story. I created Fictionary based on that premise. So, you know, that's my heartfelt, th this was my dream was to help as many writers as possible be able to do this for themselves. So I, I chose the term story edit because there's lots of terms out there. There's structural edit, there's um, content edit, there's line edit, and on and on it goes. And when I first started writing, I thought, I don't, I don't know what any of these things are, but what I want is a good story. That's what I want. So I um, coined the term, not coined it, but I used the term story edit for an edit that looks at the big picture of your, of your manuscript. And so it's looking at the structure with the story arc and the word count per scene. It's looking at the characters in the scenes. It's looking at the plot and it's looking at the settings. What it's not doing is copy editing, which is, you know, where Lisa comes in. Um, and the reason I think it's important for every writer is, is and, and this is based on feedback from also interviewing our writers who use Fictionary. We found that um, people learn a lot and so writers learn how to tell a good story by editing their own and really analyzing it. And when you learn how to tell a good story, um, it does a couple of things for you. And one is it helps you uh, work with editors if you choose to go that route, because by editing your own story, you know what that means and you learn all the terms and you figure out what goes into it. And so when you're, you're working with a professional editor, you can talk one on one on their level and, and the communication is much easier. And it'll also, once you story edit your own story, your next novel is easier to write. And so it, it shortens um, the time and the amount of effort you have to put in because once it's ingrained in you, what makes a great story, you just know it and you use it. And so I'll give you, uh, I've got a couple of examples. So I'll give you a quick example of when I first got my agent and she handed my novel off to an editor. And one of the very first comments I got back was, you need to make your protagonist likable. And I thought, what? I, oh, okay, great, I'll do that. Because I, you know, I had my agent, I thought, yes, I can do that. I didn't have a clue what it meant. Like, well, how do you make somebody likable? And so this was really the beginnings of Fictionary where I started to really investigate, well, if a, if a character doesn't have a goal for a scene, well, what are they doing? Nothing, so they're boring. Okay, well, a boring character is not likable, so that's no good. Okay, what if they have a goal, but they get them in every scene? Well, great, they're still boring and still not likable because they're just getting everything. And you think, well, they just get everything. So why would I read this book? There's no disasters. And the same on the opposite side. Well, if they lose every single scene, you think, oh my, this is just too depressing. I don't want to read this. And so 
I started to analyze just from that one comment, what does make a character likable? And so that's kind of what's gone into, um, you know, my learning of all of the story elements and how to use them. So then I moved on and I went to, uh, I did a graduate course at, at Humber School for Writers. And I was lucky enough to have Joan Barfoot as a mentor. And she's a Canadian writer who's known for perfect writing. And one of the first things she said back to me was, um, Christina, you don't know how to use a comma and you need to go learn it. Mortified, you think, what? O okay, I you know, thought about where I was in my career and things and how embarrassing was that? So I literally spent two months learning the comma. And boy, do I wish I'd had pro writing aid back then because I didn't know about it. I mean, it was really in its infancy days when that was going on. And I had no idea there was software out there that could help me with that. So I spent two months, Chicago manual style, grammar girl, like just everything I could find on a comma. So, you know, of course, I love pro writing aid for that reason, because it makes it much easier for me. That's clearly not my strength as a writer. Um, so with that, what I want to do is turn it over to Lisa and ask her why she thinks writers should copy edit their own story. You know, it's interesting because the thing that you share with Chris Banks, who's our founder, is this weird obsession with commas. And he, in the same way, like within pro writing aid, he, I can't remember the exact number. There's maybe 24 different explanations around commas, depending what, how you've used your comma. And we still sometimes get them wrong. Like commas are so complicated and there's so many different ways to use them. And I think that was one of the things that he got really obsessed with as well is just looking at what are the, what are the building blocks of these sentences? How do they fit together and how do these tools, because essentially all a comma, all a punctuation is, is a tool to help people understand how to make sense of these words that you've put in there and to help you know where you should have a little pause and then continue saying what you're saying. And, you know, exclamation point, it's all helping you understand how to read these words in your brain so that they make sense. And I think that's, that's sort of what copy editing is for me and some people call it there's line editing copy editing but like Christina I just sort of talk about it all as copy editing because what I think the most important thing to remember is that copy editing is when you are looking at the tools that allow you to get your ideas out of your head and into the heads of your readers and how do you do that in the with the fewest bumps as possible and every time you know when you're reading something and you go wait, what? And you go back and you have to read that sentence again. Everybody does it. I do it probably four times a day when I'm reading, you know, just poorly written newspaper articles and that sort of thing. So the art of copy editing is removing all those bumps and thinking about how your reader is going to be taking your ideas. So you're not thinking about what you're trying to say nearly as much anymore as you are thinking about how your reader is going to experience those words and what are the technical ways that you can make that happen. Oh, and in the chat, someone's asked about apostrophes. Don't even get me started on apostrophes. I see misused apostrophes all the time. But yeah, so that's, and, and as the, so we went back to the question of, should you be doing your own self-editing and why is it important for you as a writer to do a lot of that self-editing? Because you can send it off to, to the pros. You know, you can send, you could send a piece of junk off to Joellen and she would do her best to try and make it good. But actually in a lot of ways, you're, that's not the best that you can do for your own work. If you're going to spend the time creating this masterpiece and you've got a first draft, it's you need to put the time in to make that better. And that's that's where so much of the magic happens. I mean, if any book that you read, probably 20%, 30% maybe is what was originally in the first draft when you're just trying to get it out and you're just trying to get the story pieces in place and Maybe you're not even sure where it's going to go or who these characters are if you're more of a seat of the pantser. And so going back and doing that self-edit is when you can look and see if you're painting the picture that you meant to paint. So when your reader is reading your paragraphs, reading your chapters, is the movie that's playing in their mind, is it as full as it could be? Does it have all the elements that make it really engaging that does it touch on those emotions that's when you can go back and really polish those and fill it in and give it you know the things that will make it really memorable for your reader 
So yeah, that's why I think that's up to you. And then once you get it to a point where you think it's the best that you can be, that's when I think it's great to bring in that outside set of eyes that the people who are the professionals who have been trained, who have spent years, you know, learning what makes a great story, what makes great writing and get their opinion on it. And the better that you have it before it reaches them, the more they'll be able to do with it. And so with that, shall, we, shall I pass it over to you, Joellen, and you can talk about your sort of phase in the process? Sure, sure. I mean, when you come to a, a, a professional editor, there's a lot of things you probably want to ask them. And there are many questions that you can go on, but I'll try to keep it really brief on how to best meet a professional editor. Because as, as Lisa knows, we've been working and creating this new monthly webinar with the self-editing school. And really the, the point of that is that, yeah, you can hire a professional editor and, and many people do, they just get fed up, tired, or they don't know, or they don't have the time or whatever it is. And that's totally fine. Um, but then there's this whole other set of, um, you know, master craft workers on their writing who will do everything to make sure that it's perfect. And when we have that, then we really wanna make sure that they, they know the basics of what to do in editing because writing is completely separate from those two. So when you come in, you're gonna to wanna to talk to your editor because it is kind of a matchmaking, you know, you're gonna spend time, it, it's, you know, you've just written, you, it's your baby. You, know, you, you have created this masterpiece, this manuscript, and it can be on any level, you know, it can be the story, but it could also be, you know, uh, your thesis, your dissertation. It could be something like your, your pitch for a, a business uh, proposal. So those are very, very important that when you do that, that you trust the person who's going to do that and you respect them for what their advice is going to be. So there's a lot of things to look at there. And part of the things you need to look at is what is their experience? You know, do they have proof of success in editing? There's a lot of freelancers out there. You know, we're in the midst still of COVID. And, you know, anybody who writes a book is not necessarily an editor. And I think Christina could definitely speak up for that, that it takes a long time to become an editor and they are specially trained, they're vetted. And that's why, you know, even our editors who have years and years in the public in the publishing world and also in PhDs and in, in, in helping with the journal publications and things like that, we still go ahead and we vet them and we train them and we certify them in all these different ways so that this editor is really um, the best for you. And as a company, as a company, I can say, okay, you know, we have a satisfaction guarantee here because we know that they, we vetted them. So you want to ask them what their experiences are and, and what their expertise is, you know, because just because they're a content editor, it doesn't mean a content editor of nonfiction would be any, would have any use getting into a children's book <laughs> or another fiction book. You know, you keep these divisions. So we, we, keep all of our divisions and then what type of editor they are, what they're looking at. And then of course, you know, showing your, you their work and having some references, which is, you know, we put that up on our website. It's just easier in today's world, but to, to see, you know, what other people experienced. And just because they're a great editor, they still may not be the best match for you. So again, you want to make sure that they see and understand and really buy into your voice. And that's going to be a lot of explanation on your part. They may be very good, but they're not able to read your mind. So they really need to understand who your audience is, what your uh, what your goal is for this writing. You know, what what you're trying to achieve is it that you want to be a bestseller? Is it that you want to be a public speaker? That you want to sell more? You want to get accepted into something? Those are all different reasons there. And then of course. Um, asked to see their work. And the easiest way is, of course, getting a sample of some sort and getting some feedback from them. And, you know, <clears throat> you can get more than you can go through this whole process. And uh, you can spend literally years if you want going on to directories and freelance areas, and you can interview and interview. And if that's your choice, go right ahead. What we do is we set it up and we'll find the editor that's best suited for you. And then you can try and see how that is. But again, Ask to see their works, ask to see their experience, ask to see, you know, their, their involvement in your genre and their experiences there so that you feel comfortable because that is your baby and you want to make sure that it, it feels right for you. And uh, it may take a while, but normally you can find a pretty good match if you're looking in the right place at the right time. So that's what I like to talk about. But I want to ask Tara, Tara now, what's the first step an author should take with Kobo to self-publish their novel? after they're done with the editing? 
Sure. Well, I think what you said there was really kind of um, something I wanted to hit on is to really think about who your audience is. I think that's very important. Um, so once your book is finished and you've kind of made the best book that you can, you know, it's gone through all the editing process and, you know, you're considering it done. Um, definitely think about where you want to get this book. Like, what do you want to get from it? Um, like you were saying, is it being a bestseller? Is it something that you want your family to be able to read? Or is it just that you want to keep churning these books out? So I definitely would make a plan around releasing um, your book and kind of sticking to that. Um, so I kind of just think about the story that you want to tell. We often have people that are writing sort of um, serialized books, and sometimes they want to make sure that they have a few books ready before they even start their publishing process. Um, so I think it's really important to do some research, um, and especially some market research. Um, with anything independent publishing, it can be kind of difficult to know where to start. Art. even if you've ever tried to just google that you get bogged down with a lot of things there um so my team is sort of a small team of um experts on all things indie publishing so if you reach out or if you have any questions at writinglife at kobo.com we'll definitely be able to help um so i think the first step would be is you know are you going to go down the independent route and if you are um have you decided where to publish and who you want to publish with um so if you want to come direct with kobo um there's a lot of benefits from coming direct um meaning to publish with kobo rather than going through an aggregator um but these are kind of decisions that you want to make sometimes it might be easier for you um to have one place that's going to publish um one aggregator that will publish to many places kind of figure out what amount of time that you're going to put into it um and you know as you're the author and publisher i think you know think of this now as a business once you're launching your book and um, kind of you have all of the control and do your research and see the platforms that are there and will be there to assist you if you do need help with any questions about this. Um, so I want to ask Christina, so let's say the author has written their book, but they don't feel like it's quite complete and they want to do their self edit. So how can they use Fictionary for that? I think I'd know that by now. Uh, that's a great, a super timely question because somebody just asked in the chat, should I use PWA as in pro writing aid first and then fictionary and, and it's the other way around. And, and so it leads into me answering this question. And the reason for that is, um, you know, it's okay, of course, to copy at it as you go. Lots of people do. Um, some people do none. That, that's a totally uh, a writer choice. But if you don't have your story set and finished, you're going to spend a lot of time copy editing things that you might cut, rewrite, move around. And so you have to do it all over again. So the idea is that you finish your story, have it set, and then do a hard copy edit in Pro Writing Aid. Um, Pro Writing Aid works within Fictionary. So we have lots of writers who go, who, you know, your eye sees it and, and you just want to fix it. I totally get that. But what I'm recommending is you don't don't spend hours perfecting it and then go back and rewrite your story. It's just a lot of work on, on well, your part. I, there's nothing more heartbreaking than having to delete something that you've spent. If you write a whole package or a whole passage and then spend 45 minutes, you know, fixing it all up and then you realize it doesn't fit and you have to cut it. It's heartbreaking. Right. Right, right. And you know, and as an editor, I do recommend sometimes people cut, you know, a whole scene or, or maybe even a chapter. And it's always really hard for me to do that. And I give an explanation of why, but it's always related to the story and not um, to, to copy editing at that point. So what we hear from our subscribers, this is what I'll tell you what, what how writers benefit from, from Fictionary Storyteller. And the biggest comment we get back is people learn how to tell a story and I say tell a story versus writing a story because you write your whole draft of course you do you've got that down you know that's a huge accomplishment in itself and then you need to evaluate it and figure out how to tell it and within Fictionary there's an extensive library of, of writing tips that that help you for each of the 38 Fictionary story elements of if you don't know what a, an entry hook or an exit hook is or how to use it it's right there with you so you don't have to spend hours searching and trying to find things um, and and you might not even know about it so 
you know, if you're earlier in the process and maybe you're on your first novel, there's a lot of things that need to be looked at on a scene by scene basis. And if you don't even know what they are, you don't even know what to go and research to look up. So Fictionary organizes it and structures it in a way that you can look at it in a bite-sized fashion. And we focus really hard on scenes with the belief that, you know, every scene has to be powerful. And if you get powerful scene after powerful scene in the right order, fitting your story arc, then you have a powerful story that readers love. And so the idea is to help writers focus on bite-sized bits. So scene at a time um, and figure it out. And then as you go through your scenes, it gets faster. Um, our more experienced writers, they know uh, which elements they have trouble with and maybe just focus on those and skip the others because they know they're great at it. You know, some writers are just awesome at setting, which I find dreadfully hard. Can I jump in and tell you my favorite one of those? This is yeah. the one that I used the other day with my with my um, daughter who was writing a story. One of the things that that had just never really occurred to me is that's in there is it asks, um, have you used the weather in this scene? Because weather is like an amazing way to set atmosphere. And so my daughter and I were talking about in this scene where this little girl was feeling lonely, like, should we make it sunny? Should we make it rainy? How do you, how would, how do you think this would fit in there? And I only, that only occurred to me because of using Fictionary and seeing that as like just one thing that you can think about that might add yeah. power to the scene. And there's loads yeah. of things like that. There's, there's tons and it just depends um, as you as a writer and somebody just asked about how it works. So Fictionary, you import your whole manuscript and it gets analyzed and it draws your story arc for you. It does your word count per scene and shows it to you so you can see the whole thing and what your structure looks like. It links characters per scenes. So you get a whole visual. But what you also do is you work on your manuscript within Fictionary. So there's a place where you edit and you, you work through each of the story elements are on one side and your manuscripts on the other and you work through it. And right on the place where you edit, there's this beautiful little icon for Pro Writing Aid. And if you click that, their um, uh, pop-up shows up and you can do your copy editing. And when you get exit the pop-up, well, lo and behold, there are all your changes right in the Fictionary text. And so you can bounce back and forth. If you don't want to copy edit, you just want to focus on story, you can turn that off and just wait till you're ready and then go and do it. So it, it's quite flexible in that way, but it's really a place that once you have a first draft written, and I don't mean it has to be like a finished story, but you've got a draft you import it and you just start working on it. And so the final thing I'll say that does for writers that, that you know, uh, the comment that somebody just emailed me the other day out of the blue was she had her novel in a drawer for years and just had no idea how to finish it. She was so stuck creativity, creativity wise that she couldn't do anything. And she put it in Fictionary and all of the story elements made her think about it in a different way. And she actually finished her book. And so that was very exciting to me because it sparked her creativity to, to finish something that she'd gotten so far on and now she's at the end and going to self-publish it. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and I really think the visuals, like just being able to take your story and look at it in a different way with a different part of your brain just clears clogs a little bit. Like it just lets you look at things in a different sort of way and see, you know, where maybe the holes are that you couldn't see when you were trying to look at all 70,000 words at once. This, this like breaks it down and lets you see patterns and where maybe things aren't fitting and maybe where right you know, and I mean the, the great thing is, is these are the same tools that my editors are using I mean obviously they've got more training and all the other things but this is the baseline this is where you build your foundation and and if you don't have that tool yet or you know which of course we think you should but you can always just uh, check out the 38 story elements and it, it's really quite thorough to go through each of those and make sure that you're not missing anything in a fiction story uh, it's hard work, but it's great work. Like it's really, <laughs> it's where, like I say, it's where a lot of the magic happens because it just allows you to, to add power and, and make it more, just hit you a bit harder in the emotions and, and, and engage with you. It's great. Yeah. So that's Sounds over like you, Lisa, that, on, on sorry. how... Oh, did I miss oh, it? I just I just wanted to say that it sounds like using Fictionary is like putting on editor glasses so you can see it differently for the first time like you're a manuscript that you're like really stuck in the story of. Yep. Right. Yeah yep. I think that's exactly that's exactly it and you know that's sort of how 
for writing aid is useful as well. I mean, you could go, you could start at the beginning and just go through every single word and look at every single sentence just on your own and make sure you're saying it in the best way. But what the way pro writing aid works is I always think of it as I imagine like a little Joellen sitting on my on my shoulder saying, uh, excuse me, you've, you've written that sentence in, in passive voice. Sometimes that's problematic. Not sure what that means. Um, click this little eye icon right mm. here in the tool, which then opens up an explanation of why passive voice can be problematic. And there's a little video there that tells you how. And then if you click through, it gives you a whole information with a whole ton of information with 10 different examples to help you really understand what we're talking about when we're saying passive voice sometimes doesn't engage in the same way with your reader. And then you can go through it and go through it that way. And, and you could do it, you know, one sentence at a time, make sure you've done all that. But I just think that it's, it's a useful tool. It's an intelligent assistant. I don't really like saying AI because it sounds like robot robots are editing your book for you, which that's, that's not what it's about. I think of it as, as intelligent assistants. It's just showing you the areas that could potentially be problematic. And like I say, it's about information flow from your head smoothly into the head of your reader. And there's lots of really technical ways that 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 can bump that up. Like I am terrible for writing really long meandering sentences that have 10 different points in them. And they I've started with the least important information at the front and, you know, they're just a bit of a mess. And so it flags them and it says, we think this sentence might be sticky. We think this is your fourth sentence in a row that you've started with an ing verb, which, you know, is fine using once, but four in a row, you've got a problem there and you need to <laughs> mix it up. Oh. Same thing, we've got visuals as well. So you can see how all of your sentences fit together because sentence variety is really important in terms of engaging your reader. And if all of your sentences are, I don't know, 18 words long, and it just becomes a bit monotonous. It's like writing should be like singing, you know, there's big bits and there's short bits and it goes in and out and it, and it flows in that sort of way. And so in the sentence length report, you can, you can literally see a bar graph that shows you all your different sentences. And if you've got six in a row that are 17 words, then go in, fix them up, add a bit more music to that scene. Right. Um, it's yeah. really great. I mean, again, those are the same tools and, and it takes time to learn all that. I mean, it's a massive amount. The, the coolest part is it's like you said, it's all there. You have like this online library, an online, you know, Yale or Chicago manual style, all accessible way more than it would ever be even with the internet. But at the same point, you still have to learn that grammar and this punctuation. So the cool thing is, is by using it day in and day out, when it's in your email, when it's in your Word, Word doc, when it's in your, you know, it's online, any form you fill out online, any uh, review you place on Google, it's going to make sure you, you don't embarrass yourself, your texts, whatever you're doing, right? I mean, it's, it's just chasing you. It's really cool because eventually you will see, okay, I have a problem with commas, I'm gonna fix the commas. I, and you start to catch yourself again and <laughs> yeah. again and again. And so that's good. And it does take time. So it's not you know, something that goes, pow, we have the, the magical editing powder and it just, it's done. But it also lets you become um, you know, more knowledgeable about your own self and, and improve and you become that master writer. And until then, you know, you're still working with the editor who can come in on a much deeper level and you're really getting your money's worth because I'm not going to lie to you, editing costs money. And, you know, these tools will get, make sure that you get your best return on investment because the editors are not going to be wasting time with commas. They're going to be digging into the whole structural, the developmental, the, the story arc, the, you know, everything that is just those little bits of glosses that make you stand out because millions of people are typing right now. Yeah, I think so too. The other thing that I think is really um, useful is it's that learning, it's, it's helping you develop that language so that when you're talking to your editors, you understand what they're talking about. That. And using Fictionary, you understand elements of scene, you understand elements of point of view. You, like, you just learn to use that language so that when you are working with your editor, you're, you're coming at a similar level and you can understand their feedback in a way that you might not have otherwise. And similarly, you know, even that's true, even at sentence level, you know, if you're, if you've taken a creative writing course or a writing course of any kind, and you've learned, you know, really sort of theoretical technique things, it's hard to put that into practice when you're actually writing something. Whereas if you've written a sentence and then you get a little flag and it says, oh, this, this is 
this is passive voice and you're like what what's passive voice again so you go have a look then it's going to stick in there and you you know you can make the change right then and that that bit of learning is going to stick a lot more on a on a practical level compared to something that's very theoretical and highly conceptual um okay where where are we at oh oh uh, joellen ne my next question that i was going to ask you about is because I know we get this question a lot in self-editing school is how do people figure out what kind of editor they need and and what level they should be working at? Right. And there's a, it, the easiest way to determine what there's, you know, basically I always keep it very simple, but there's three levels of editing. And, you know, it's the, the top level that, that Christina talks about in uh, fiction is the story edit. It's also the content or structural, developmental or substantive edit. It's really when you're digging into the overall uh, the bones of the, the story or the proposal, the manuscript in itself. And that's when you're still, you know, you're, if you don't feel that you're completely confident with that, then you're probably still at that level. <laughs> That's the easiest way to say it. And, um, you know, having somebody else who, that it makes sense as it goes through. And then you have, after that, you have line edit. So if you're very confident, you know, some people come to us, they, they've done their storyteller uh, fiction uh, using the storyteller and they've done that level of fiction, that story edit, and then they give it to us. Well, we have certified story coaches who can come in and use that same software and take it to the next level. But on occasion, somebody's, you know, hey, they knocked out of the borrow park. This is tight. This is good. This is, there's no need to go up on that higher level of editing. We can go right next to our line editing if there's still, you know, um, subject verb agreements, if there's any grammar, if there's making sure that it flows from line to line and we're getting that pressure, then that's great. Or maybe if they're super duper, and this does happen, but not so often, then you're going down to the copy edit, which is making sure that you have a neutral third party who is a professional who can look at this before you assume it's done because we all we've all read books we read them every day and we pick up a bestseller and why is, that's so obviously misspelled or who is this person that's not even the, you know they've changed a name they've done something wrong and we and it's embarrassing so you don't want to take that chance because again it's your one chance so those are the three levels and you need to determine which editor you're going to be working with well you know, where you are in the process. Also, what are your writing needs? You know, if you are a tight, developed master writer who really has been using these tools and has been writing for 10, 20 years, then you're going to be on a much different level from somebody who's just starting out, who's still a junior writer, who's getting their feet wet and they have all these aspirations, but maybe they're still struggling with those comments. Maybe they, they have other grammar, punctuation or syntax, whatever's going on there that they need more help with. So again, the an editor can look at when we do that free sample or when you ask to you know have an evaluation of some sort, they're going to look at that and say, you know, you, your story may be great, but you're still at this level of editing, you know, or this level of writing. So we need to adjust that. So they're going to give you professional recommendations of what type of editing you need. And then the other third part that comes into that, because it's where you are in the process, what your needs are from the manuscript. And then the third one would be what you want. Um, some people have a very, very tight story, but they also have a very high uh, expectations of themselves and they want the best and the highest, no matter what they want to know. Absolutely. Somebody else came in and said, you are fantastic. This is great. You can submit it now. And if you have those questions, then of course you're going to request and, and make sure that you get the deeper critique reviews, et cetera. So when you're doing that, you know, you have those three things to consider, you know, what type of editing you need and what type of editing you need from that content line or, or copy edit, it's determined by where you are in the process. And again, that's, you know, if you need the higher level and from those processes, it's, you know, what do you need? What do you want? And where are you in the process? So those things come together and the easy solution is just to contact an editor and ask them to give you a review, give you some feedback. We do that for free. We take a look at it, send you back a sample, show you what editing looks like so you can see the value. And I think that's very important that, you know, if they're changing your voice, back off because that's gonna be a constant irritant from the very beginning. But if they're enhancing your voice and pointing out small, uh, small details that you've overlooked or you didn't even realize, then that's a really good fit, even if they annoy you. <laughs> 
<laughs> even if they annoy you, because you know you want a coach, you want somebody who's in there. They can't do the exercises for you, but they're going to whip your butt and get make sure you're getting in shape there. So that's what they're doing for you. So really, they they want to determine what level you are. But if you don't know, if you if you're still struggling with those ideas ask a professional and they'll be able to do it for you. So when you're done with editing, though, you're going to go over and you're going to start uploading your book. If you're, if you're all done with that formatting and everything, you're going to go over to Kobo. And I've been looking at this and I find it very fun. So I want Tara to walk us through the process of how it is to publish on Kobo and what we, what we can expect there, because I know you guys have a great uh, blog. I've watched that for a while and you've got the podcast. So tell us more about the process, the process of publishing on Kobo. Sure, happy to. Um, so I guess maybe one question would be like why to publish on Kobo. So to just give some context, um, Kobo is an ebook, audiobook retailer that is global worldwide. But we also have strategic partners that I sort of alluded to earlier um, that we partner with Walmart in the US. So we power all of their ebooks and their audiobooks. Um, our newest partner is Booktopia in Australia. So it's the same goes there. So um, it was kind of a strategic thing to do to partner with some kind of massive retailers and kind of make sure that books can be easily available there. And then also just one thing to also keep in mind that there's sometimes a stigma with independent publishing that, oh, that's for people that, you know, they can't make it, they can't do it on their own. And that is completely not true. Um, and it is very much changed. Um, just to, I was doing some research the other day and found that uh, a book, uh, a book that was published by Cobra Writing Life was sold every 10 seconds last year which is crazy. It's one in four English titles was independently published that sold on Kobo. So this is a huge market. Um, so don't don't undervalue, um, you know, doing the work yourself um, because it's hard work anyway, um, but we're going to try and make it as easy as possible with Kobo Writing Life. So um, when you're ready to publish, it's a really easy process. So you can create an account at kobo.com slash writing life. Um, and we do make it as easy as possible because we want to try and take the hassle out of the publishing process. You should be focusing on your writing, uh, writing the next book, um, and then your marketing, of course. So there, you're balancing all these things. And we know as an independent author, it can be complicated. So the publishing process should be something that you don't even really think twice about. Um, so there's four steps that you take when you're ready to publish your book. So the first one is that you describe your ebook. So that's where you put in all your metadata, which is just the information about your book. So your title, um, your synopsis um, and things like that and your cover image. And then the next step is to upload your file. Um, so we convert for free to an EPUB file and we accept Word docs, Mobi, HTML files, and we'll convert it to you. Um, we use EPUB as it's the industry standard and it allows people to use multiple devices. So um, of course they can use their Kobo, but they can also read that on, on different things as well. Um, so that's kind of the best device we think with digital reading and uh, Kobo does a lot of work with the W3C for accessibility so we like to make sure that our files are sort of formatted as best as possible to make them accessible for all readers. So then your third step is the rights and distribution. So this is where you get to choose where in the world you want to um, send your book off to, um, whether you have potentially maybe sold the rights in the UK, but you want to publish in Canada, you easily have the option to be able to do that by just clicking a few boxes. Um, and then we also have additional distribution options here. Um, so Kobo has a subscription program that's called Kobo Plus, um, and that's available in some of our territories. It's available in Canada, the Netherlands, and Belgium. So if you wanted to make your book available in the Netherlands for Dutch readers to read in an all you can read model, you can easily do that. Um, and then we also offer distribution to libraries, which I think is something really special. Um, we um, learned last year that 25% of the books that Kobo Writing Life sells through libraries were purchased by demand. They were demand driven, meaning readers went to their libraries, went to their librarians and asked for this specific book. Um, so making sure that the librarian has the option to purchase your book and make it available for those people that may not have the means to, to constantly buy your book and just make it available to a broader audience all around the world. You can do that really, really easily. All you have to do is enter your library price and then just click a button and it goes through. So then the last step, um, 
is to set the price of your book in general. So you can set the price in up to 16 currencies. Um, I would always advise to take advantage of all of them. Um, you might be inclined to, you know, if you were based in the States, you're just going to set your USD. But Canada is our biggest market. And unfortunately for us Canadians, they are not the same value per dollar. <laughs> so you can price it a little bit higher in Canadian because that's what the readers here are used to. Um, so I would definitely target the main territories that you want to go and make sure that you're setting the price in each place um, as, it, as is needed. Um, and then one thing to um, think about is that we don't have any upper price cap. So if your book is priced $2.99 um, Canadian or uh, American dollars, which is $1.99 in um, Great British pounds, um, you'll receive 70% on each sale, regardless of how high you price your book. Um, so you might just want to consider if you're making bundles or things like that, that you're always going to earn 70% on each sale. So once all of these steps are complete, you can publish your book. Um, so you can set a pre-order if you like, and we don't have a uh, time limit for this, so you can set a pre-order as far ahead as you like. Uh, obviously, wouldn't advise setting it like 10 years in the future because that's too much of a tease for your readers. Um, but you can definitely set it if you want to have a series rolled out. You can have like every three months your books can be set up very easily. Um, so I did mention that we had sort of a global audience and to try and think of things um, outside of your home country. Um, so one of the reasons um, that I kind of talk about this is that we do find that that's where our readers, um, where our authors have their sales. Um, so, but it kind of can be hard. Sure, we're, we're making your book available to all of these readers, but how is your book going to be seen? Um, that's where my team also jumps in and we have this um, unique promotions tool that's just for people that are publishing directly with Kobo Writing Life. Um, so this allows you to apply for promotions um, prime spots in our site. We do daily deal options, which is the most sought out for spot. Um, we're fighting off the other big publishers to try and get our books here. Um, and then there's also different sales that go on throughout the world. So um, whether it's celebrating Australia Day with a bundle of books, or if it's really getting um, our romance in specific for Valentine's Day or something like that, there's lots and lots of different options. Um, we update them on a weekly basis. Um, so I would definitely recommend having a look at what's there. And if you don't see the promotions tab, it's something that we um, roll out on request. Um, the reason being as we have authors around the world, but our promotions are mostly focused in English language right now. But if you don't see it, just send us an email and we'd be happy to add it for you. Um, and the same goes with an audiobook. If you have ready to publish, we can add that capability as well. So you can just um, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and somebody will get back to you and, and make sure it's there. And if you have any questions at all about the publishing process or uh, you want advice on, you know, taking your book published to a wide audience for the first time, uh, we're definitely happy to help. Um, as Joellen mentioned, we have a blog that we update regularly and we also have a weekly podcast that's called the Kobo Writing Life podcast, which these ladies were guests on um, not so long ago, which was very fun. It was the biggest one we've done. We had five people in one podcast and it worked out so well. Um, so Five different very... countries too, didn't we? I know. Yeah, it really worked out. And um, it's interesting. I just noticed in the chat that there was conversations about the um, uh, polyamorous romance. And yesterday I just interviewed a, uh, an author just about that and about how she's writing polyamorous romantic comedies and how she's dealing with it. So that podcast will be coming out sometime in April. So it might be helpful to, uh, to what you mentioned there. Um, okay, so shall we, we've got, we've got about 10 minutes left. Shall we see if we can race through a few of these questions? There's quite a few in there. So we'll do a bit of a like quick answer round if that's okay. Uh, the ones that have just come up, Tara, are for you. Should we do some of those ones first? Um, sure. So uh, I've got someone who says, if we publish through Kobo, will it be available on Amazon as well? It won't because we're just our own retailer, um, but we don't have any exclusivity. So you can publish to us and publish in as many places as possible. Um, and in fact, we encourage it because you know our ethos is to try and get your book in front of as many readers as possible, however they want to read them. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say um, you can publish on Amazon as well as Kobo. Right, so it's just another way to reach more, more readers, more people. Yep. Um, oh, the next question was, are there exclusive? Uh, does Kobo give an ISBN to ebooks um, when you yes. publish it? 
we do. So you, uh, you don't have to have an ISBN when you publish because um, uh, we know they're quite costly. In Canada, they're free, which is quite lucky for us. But <laughs> if you publish without one, we'll just generate you a Kobo ISBN. And you'll see this because they start with one, two, three. But no, it's not required. OK. Uh, someone says, what is an aggregator? And in brackets, it says spelling out. I'm not sure. What's an aggregator? <laughs> an <laughs> aggregator is um, someone, um, it's like an account that will publish to many places for you. Um, so one that I can think of is draft to digital is an aggregator. Um, there's also publish drive, um, smash words, there's different places. So you basically upload your book once and then they send it to all the different places that are available. However, the, then you pay them to do this. So instead of receiving your 70%, you're actually only going to receive 60% or 55 as aggregators tend to take a 10 or 15% discount further on your books. Um, there can be some bonuses um, of using an aggregator that they can get into hard to use systems. Um, so for instance, up until last year, I think to publish on Apple, you had to have a Mac. So a lot of people used aggregators just to get to Apple because it was really hard. But the general rule of thumb is you come direct to your big ones, which is um, Kobo, Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, Barnes and Noble. So the top five for indie. And then you can use an aggregator for all your other places. And um, there's lots of different library options and many different small retailers that you might not want to take the time to figure out how to do direct. Okay. Time saving device. Great. Uh, does Kobo only do ebooks? Ebooks and audiobooks. Yes, we don't do print books at all. We're just very focused on the digital reading experience. Okay. Um, does Kobo have access to book cover designs? Um, we have partners that do book cover designs. Um, we work with uh, Demanza, which is a book cover company that's based out of New Zealand. And I think we offer um, kind of a an incentive to use our, I think there's a discount for Kobo Writing Life authors. Um, but if you go to, um, there, if you're in your Kobo Writing Life account, there's a services tab. And if you click on that, you'll see sort of um, our recommended services that we have. And um, Demanza is one there that we use for covers and they do full creation or you can buy like a pre-created cover or something like that so right all right christina over to you there's a few other fictionary questions you ready i'm ready i'll go fast okay um can you upload a plot outline in fictionary and have it analyzed no we don't analyze it you can create a plot outline in fictionary and use the story elements to build your story but we're our whole mathematical analysis of the manuscript is done on a full manuscript. So you really need kind of 15,000 words or more for the analysis to start. Okay. Kat says she desperately wants to know how it draws the story arc and how it knows which scenes have plot points, but that, that is, those are secrets we're not giving away. Today. Those are Kat. secrets. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so we sort of touched on this one. Solstice says, will Fictionary replace a thorough self story edit? But it doesn't replace it. Fictionary no. is there to help you do that. That's correct. So it's what, what Lisa had said before. It's an intelligent assistant. So it's not doing it for you. It's doing some of it for you um, and pulling out the information you need. But it's still up to you as a writer to work through your story. So you own that story. It's yours to work on. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what we always say about fiction, about fiction, no, about uh, oh, writing yeah. aid too, is <laughs> people often ask, why isn't there just an accept all button? Like just, yeah, just make all the changes, fine. But that's mm -hmm. not what it's about. It's not to yeah. do it for you. It's to help you think about the things that are potentially problematic and think about areas where you could build out and make things better. It's just to, to nurture you along into the area and help you learn as you go along, right? And you, you should never accept all on on even even uh, professional editors because they they have chosen these these decisions and these changes or these recommendations for specific reasons, but that doesn't mean they're right and they're human. So there still can be and are occasionally mistakes. And the same way that when uh, when I'm using uh, pro writing aid every day is telling me something like no ignore no ignore <laughs> and then I go on to the next one oh yeah you're right okay fix that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, it's it's really the way it goes it, it, it there's nothing perfect out there and lord help and us don't be afraid of the ignore don't be afraid no. of the ignore no. you know if something comes up and it says hey did 
what about this? This could be problematic. And no. if you read it, then maybe you try <laughs> write the sentence out two more times and you think, yeah, I got it. This is doing the job that I want this sentence to do. Then hit ignore. That's fine. Absolutely. There's no, it's Absolutely. not saying you're doing it wrong. You're not changing things. It's up to you to help you find the best way. I think everyone just needs to take ownership of it. You know, even mm -hmm. though you finished writing, once editing means you write again and it's called revisions, revisions, revisions. And then at some point you have to just make the, the decision, okay, now I can stop. But, uh, you know, hard, it, you, can, you can just keep revising for years if you wanted to, but that's kind of where the, the professional comes in and says, no, 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 this is good. Don't, don't shine anymore. We've got it shiny. We have a, a top author that tells us that she reads her books again every year and she's oh, been wow. publishing for 20 or 30 years and she deliberately does it. And this is a romance writer um, because she wants to make sure the technology is up to date. So she goes uh -huh. back to her like 15 year old book and then like, it's kind of like, oh, did you mention a Blackberry? I'm going to change it over to something else or a pager or whatever. Um, but then she said that she has a hard time with like not digging into the editing again. I'm like, yeah. it must be so difficult. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, I quite like how technology situates a story in a certain time frame and you think, yeah. oh, Me too. An Atari or whatever. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose it doesn't work for, for everybody. Um, <laughs> one thing that I just wanted to say before I can see that people are starting to drop off. And before you go, we just wanted to let you know that on the Kobo uh, Facebook page, I'm just dropping this, we're going to be doing a live Q&A. So we're just going to answer questions there. Um, so I've just dropped a link to the Kobo Writing Life Facebook page there. So if you go and follow that, then details are coming out next week for for yep. joining. Okay. Yes. Um, and then we've got a prize as well if you go along, don't we? Giveaway. We do. There's a big giveaway. Um, and we're all giving something away. So from my end, we're having a Kobo, the Kobo Nia uh, e-reader is going to be given away. Christina, do you want to talk about yours? Yes, we're going to give away a um, an annual subscription to Storyteller. So that's $200 value. Ooh, and Joelle, well, we did not want to be outdone. So we did $200 of just editing. In, and that means you can come in at whatever you need, but it's $200. There you go. You can spend it with us in our store. Yeah, and we're throwing in a one year pro writing aid premium license as well. So someone that comes along is going to win that big ultimate editing prize. If you end up, um, <laughs> we were saying earlier, what if people come here and they think it sounds great and they use our voucher and then they win the prize. If you win the prize, we will refund you whatever you have bought today. Um, if you go in and you want to you want to try out Pictionary and use that that discount. And um, so I just wanted to drop that so that you can grab it and have a look. Um, and then we've got we still have a couple more, maybe two more questions. Um, let's see, what about beta readers? How do you guys feel about beta readers and how do they fit into the process? Oh, I can start. I, I, I have beta readers. It took me, oh, a year or two to really work out what I needed from a beta reader. And the most important thing I can say about beta readers is probably they're, unless they're complete strangers, they're people who care about you. And so they will have a hard time critiquing you because they don't want to hurt your feelings. So if you give them specific questions about what you're looking for, and questions are easy, could you mark anywhere you skim? And they go, sure. And what that means is they're bored, they're skimming, but they'll never tell you they're bored somewhere, right? But if, <laughs> if they mark it, you're, you, you get that hugely valuable piece of information. Mark anywhere you're confused or mark anywhere you where you think I don't believe that and mm. those things alone just giving specific advice to your beta readers enables them to give you feedback without feeling like they're going to hurt your feelings right and mark those sentences that I was talking about before where you stop and you go what and you go back and you have to read it again just put mm -hmm. a little tick next to that saying I had to stop you lost me for a second there I came out of your fiction world and had to like look at your writing and try and make sense of things and then dove back in again. You don't want people coming out of that little world. Um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to say is like this whole process is magical, like going back and building out your story, going back and looking at the language, getting those professional eyes on it and then getting it out into the world. The whole thing is great. And we really hope that this has helped you figure out how to navigate that and how those different phases work together. Because I know sometimes story editing and copy editing gets a bit mixed up and 
how does professional fit into that and do you have to do that edit yourself and and when you're how do you know when you, it's ready to go out publishing so i hope this has helped make sense of that journey a little bit so thank you everyone for coming i really appreciate it thank you thanks to yeah. my editing superstar team here Ooh. for sharing all of their all of their knowledge Oh, have a look at the chat. Everyone's saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I know, it's so nice. I love nice. this part. It just makes you feel good. Remember to come <laughs> see us for the Q&A at the Facebook Live. Yeah. We'll see you again at the self-editing school. So if they got more editing questions, that's a good time to get them in there too. Yeah, uh, that's right. If, uh, so Joellen's next self-editing school is March 18th. And actually Tara's going to be back. She's going to do a full Kobo writing life walkthrough yes. on March 30th. So I'm there's lots of places that. to come and we'll, we love talking about all this stuff actually. So this is, this is great that we've got lots of different events coming up. Yeah. Um, and if um, Facebook isn't your uh, jam, uh, the live event next Thursday will also be on YouTube. So you can hit up either of our channels and watch them live there. Oh, cool. Nice. And what time was it? Someone has just, I, I didn't drop the actual time. time I, I believe uh, it's like, noon Eastern standard, but I will have oh, to I double check. Seven. I think it's seven. 11. Okay. Eastern. Right. Right. <laughs> Okay. 11, Eastern, Ele so we'll 11 Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, then yeah, I guess we'll see you all then. Oh. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.